Hey folks, welcome back for module 17 of the CompTIA A plus course. This module is called Managing Security Settings. Now for those of you that's new on the channel, welcome, welcome. Please be aware this course does consist of 20 modules and you might want to go check out module 1 first. Unless of course you're looking for something specific, then well, stay here. For those of you that are not new, welcome back. This module consists of two sections. The first is configure workstation security. The second section we're going to be diving into is troubleshoot workstation security issues. Now, for those of you that's new here, you might not be aware, in the video description down below, I've got a more accurate list of what will be covered in this specific module. And for your convenience, I've added nice little timestamps there so you can go and jump to specific topics if you're just looking for something specific or if you would like to go and revise on something. Now, for those of you who don't know yet, this might actually include some of my current um, subscribers and viewers. Once I've covered all 20 modules of this course, I'm going to be making an extra couple of videos, which I'll put in the same playlist for you guys. These videos will be practice questions. Before you ask, no, it is not the actual questions from the actual exam. That is not allowed by this vendor or any, any other vendor, quite frankly. It's not allowed. My questions will, however, cover the same exam objectives and measure you on the same skills. So I will be going through the questions, through the possible answers. We'll be reading them. We'll be discussing them. That's basically what's going to happen in those videos. So, yeah, stay tuned for that. Once we've covered the course, I will be adding that for you guys as an extra in the same playlist. Hopefully, it will help a couple of you guys out. All right, so speaking of helping people out, if you haven't done it already, you can help me out by giving this video a like. I mean, I am doing this stuff for you guys for free. Same goes for those practice questions I'm going to be doing for you guys. And if you'd like to know when the next module comes out or those practice questions, maybe consider subscribing. Otherwise, you might miss it. All right, folks, let's jump into that first section, configure workstation security. The first thing I'm going to be talking here about is password best practices. What you should do and what you should not do in a nutshell. Well, at least the basics of that. First thing up, complexity requirements. Now, something you guys will notice these days, you can go pretty much anywhere. You can go onto any machine, any device, any platform, any website, quite frankly, and you will find that when you go and choose a password, First of all, it's going to force you to choose a password. You can have a blank password. And it is also going to force you to have a certain length of that password. Has to have certain characters, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. Now, this is the complexity requirements we're referring to. You'll find that almost all platforms and websites these days require you to have at least a minimum of an eight-character password. It could be more, but generally it's no less than eight characters uppercase, lowercase, and special characters and all that kind of stuff. So length, very, very important, guys. The more characters you've got in your password, the harder it is to guess the password and also the harder it is to crack that password. So a long password, it is good. When it comes to character types, the more diverse your characters are and the more all over the place they are, the better. Do not use actual words or phrases, although most platforms these days probably won't allow you to do that anyway. But try and avoid that. So if something does allow you to go and use actual words or actual phrases as a password, guys, do not do that. It is very easy to guess that. So instead, I recommend very highly you go and use all kinds of characters. That's why most platforms will force you to do that, because the average Joe, unlike you guys, does not know IT. They don't know why they have to have these special characters. They just get annoyed by it and they know they have to go and do it, but they don't understand why. Now, you guys at least will understand why. Now, something else we need to be aware of here is expiration. You'll find that almost all platforms nowadays, especially in company environments, will make your password expire. Now, other platforms like social media websites and that kind of stuff, probably not so much. But if you look at like company stuff, you know, let's say a company domain, maybe your cloud accounts, like your Microsoft 365 accounts, all of these platforms will generally have a password that expires after a certain period of time. Now, how long exactly does it take for your password to expire? That, folks, I cannot tell you because it's subject to the administrator's discretion. So if you look at something like an Active Directory password, 
The default period is 42 days, but most people like myself will normally go and change that. We would normally make it a shorter period. The shorter, the better. You need to be careful though, for every action, there is a reaction. You don't want to make the password too short because what's going to happen then is the password is going to expire so flippin' quickly that people will not have time to even remember their password. You also need to be careful with the complexity requirements we spoke of earlier. Don't make the password requirements too long. Don't make them too complex because what's going to happen then is people will actually forget their passwords way more often. And that's going to result in them being in your office every second day saying, I forgot my password or mailing you, or sending you a message, or you know, whatever. They're gonna annoy you, they're gonna annoy your team, and um, if that's not gonna happen, what's gonna happen is they're gonna write the passwords down on a piece of paper, or a sticky note, and before you know it, every second screen has got a sticky note on a screen with the password on it. So is the complexity requirements actually helping you then? No, because every second Billy Willy and his uncle has the password on the screen. Not exactly helpful, is it? All right, let's move on. End user best practices. So from the end user's perspective, keep in mind this might actually be you as well, log off when not in use. So referring to, for the most part, laptops and desktops here, guys, but I suppose it also applies to phones and tablets. But we're coming at this from a laptop or a desktop perspective. So when you or one of your users are not using their machine, you need to log off. Lock the PC, in other words. So the way you do that is to press the Windows key and the L key. And for those of you not familiar with the Windows key, that will be the one of the little Windows flag icon on it. It's generally at the bottom left of your keyboard. It's somewhere between your Control key and your Alt key. It's got like a little Windows logo flag icon on it. That, guys, is the Windows key. If you press that key and the L key, the number, the letter L on your, on your keyboard, that locks your machine. It takes you to the screen where you would normally have to type in your Windows password. Now, it does not actually close anything on the machine, so if you're worried about that, guys, don't worry. Everything and anything that was open on the machine is still perfectly fine. It's still open. You don't even need to go and save this stuff. You just press the Windows key in the L screen, locks the PC. It's as if you just started the PC. It's going to ask you for a password. And if you need to go and resume your work, well, you just need to provide your password, and you can carry on exactly where you left off. But for some other weenie at your office that wants to come and sit at your PC, and get up to some sort of shenanigans on your machine, maybe frame you or go and snoop on your documents, guess what? They're going to get stopped by this password. Or at the very least, they're going to get slowed down by this password. Now, in no way will a password ever stop someone completely. All you want to do is you just don't want to hand it to them on a silver platter. They need to work for it. They need to struggle to get your data. That's the idea here. So logging off mitigates lunchtime attacks. So if you go out for lunch, at least you know it's not going to be on a silver platter. They're going to have to really struggle to get into your PC. Um, using screensaver locks might also be useful, although this is kind of being phased out in my opinion. So I don't know why CompTIA has included this in the course, but yeah, I suppose you can go and use a screensaver lock. So if you have a PC that goes into a screensaver mode, you know, when the PC is not in use, as soon as you move the mouse or you interact with the keyboard and you want to resume, it's going to ask you for a password. That's what they mean by screensaver lock. You can also alternatively go and manually lock the workstation, which is what I was saying, the Windows key and L, of course. Something else we can talk about here when it comes to end-user best practices is secure, protect, or critical hardware. So you need to go and protect your hardware, guys. So what we have here is equipment locks. You'll find that this actually applies to both desktop PCs as well as laptop PCs. If you go look at desktop PCs and laptops, you'll find that not all of them can actually do this. Most of them probably cannot. But at the back of some desktop pieces, you'll find it's like a little bit of a lip sticking out. After the panel is slided in and, you know, basically clipped into place, there's a bit of a lip sticking out, which actually allows you to go and take something like a padlock and, well, lock it. So someone will not be able to slide the panel off unless they have the key to that padlock, of course. When it comes to laptops, you'll find some laptops have a special slot on them, kind of like your charger slot, if you want to call it something. And in that slot, there's a special chain that clips into that slot. Now at first glance, guys, you're going to find that this chain looks very similar to a bicycle chain. Quite frankly, it actually is very much the same. You know, it's got like a little color coding around it. You know, it's got an actual steel cable inside of this chain. I'm calling it a chain, but it's actually a steel cable. 
and it's color coded around that or some sort of special transparent rubber which makes it look all nice and shiny and all that kind of stuff some of them have got color coding around it some of them don't the point is you slide that into your laptop special slot and it allows you to tie that laptop down to something like a table which is hopefully a fixed table at least then people cannot just go and grab your laptop when you're not there put it in the backpack or put it under their shirts and just walk away with your laptop nope this laptop has now been chained down or at least cabled down if you want to call it a cable for the most part very very useful something else we can talk about in this topic is secure personally identifiable information in other words PII and passwords so you need to be very careful you know I should say your users need to be very careful like I said earlier users have this tendency to go and write down very important sensitive stuff on a sticky note or a piece of paper that is not good guys that is very unsecure if any weasel and his uncle walks past that desk and they know what they're looking for they can go and sit there they can go go through all the rubbish paper all the sticky notes all the papers and eventually i guarantee you they will find something which is why you get something called dumpster diving something i believe we have covered in this course before You'll get people who will go for your trash bin underneath your desk in the hopes of finding something sensitive, something of value, possibly something like a password or a bank account number or a credit card number. You never know. So it's very important that you make sure this information is secure. Now, with us, I don't think that's such a big problem because obviously we know about this kinds of stuff. It's more your users. So you want to make sure that your users in your company or your client's company does not go and write down passwords or anything like a password on a piece of paper. So you might want to go and educate these people. I'm not saying they have to go and attend an A-plus course, perhaps, but you want to go and educate these folks and tell them, guys, don't write something important down on a piece of paper. Don't. So with that being said, that brings us to the clean desk policy. Keep the desks as clean as possible. I'm not saying there should not be any papers there. I'm just saying there should not be anything of value on those papers. Do not store unencrypted documents or make unauthorized copies. So if someone needs to go and store a document which is very sensitive in nature, it needs to be encrypted. If someone wants to make a copy of something sensitive, it needs to be authorized. Certain people need to know about this and it needs to be authorized first before these copies can be made, of course. All right, folks, moving on to account policies. So when it comes to policies, what am I referring to? Well, this can actually be a lot of policies, guys, but today we're going to be talking about things like restrict login times. So you can actually, as the administrator in a company environment, this is more in a domain environment, by the way, you can go and restrict when your users can log on to their domain machines. So if you know for a fact your users only work from 8 o'clock in the morning until about, let's say, 5 in the afternoon, you can, in fact, go and restrict those logon times. You can go and say, these people on these accounts can only log on between, let's say, 8 in the morning and 5 in the afternoon. If they try and log on at any time which is not within that specified time slot, it will not work. It's going to block them. Now you can actually go and add on to that, which is not really the topic here. You can actually go and have it send you a notification, an alert of sorts, where it informs you that some guy or some lady has just tried to log on to their account at, let's say, 9 o'clock at night because that is suspicious. Who's to say it was that person? For all we know, that person might be somewhat compromised. Someone might actively be trying to log on to that person's account. A hacker, perhaps. So it's a good idea to maybe enforce some sort of alerts or notifications on these accounts too. But once again, it's not the actual topic here. We're supposed to be talking about policies. Now back to policies, you can also go and use failed attempts lockout. You'll be surprised how many companies out there do not actually use this? I would say easily more than 9 out of 10 companies do not use this. And yet, it is completely free and it's very, very effective. I highly, highly encourage you guys to go and make use of this in your company if you're not currently making use of it already. So what's going to happen here is it's pretty much the same as a phone or a tablet. If you get the pattern or the pin or the whatever wrong, it's either going to go and lock the device entirely or it's going to time it out. Usually it's going to go and time it out. You've got to wait an X amount of time, a minute, two minutes, five minutes, whatever. And then eventually when this timeout is now over, you can go and try again. Should you get it wrong again, it's going to just time out again for the same period or maybe even a longer period. So it can either time out or 
it can lock the device. Now, computers don't actually do that. Computers allow you to just keep trying and trying and trying, which is a bad thing, guys, because if someone like me come along and I try and use a password cracker tool on your account, sooner or later, guys, I am going to get in. So one thing that is very effective against that, guys, is failed attempts lockout. It's completely free. You just need to go and turn it on. Specify a couple of things and there you go. So if, if I come along now with my password cracker tool, guess what? It's only going to be able to try something like free passwords and then boom, it's going to get stopped. It's going to come to a grinding halt because that lockout thing is going to make my thing time out. And well, yeah, I'm just not going to get anywhere. It is extremely effective at keeping hackers out with their password cracking tools. And yet nobody uses it. So guys, if you're not using it, please, for heaven's sake, go and enforce that. The third policy we're going to talk about here is concurrent logins. So how many people can be logged on to a specific account at a given moment? Or how many people can be logged on to a certain resource at a specific moment? So sometimes we will go along and we'll go and put concurrent logon policies on something like a server where only three people can be logged on to that specific server at any given moment. Or you can go and put this on an account. Although I think here, CompTIA probably has it in mind for an account. So only one person can be logged into a account at any given moment. If a second person tries to log on to the same account, well, it's going to kick the first one out or it's going to block the second one. Either or, you get to choose. The fourth and the last thing I'm going to say here about policy specifically is use timeout or screen locks, something we spoke about earlier. Um, something you can also go look at with regards to policies is maybe enabling or disabling of accounts. So if you see anyone enabling an account or disabling an account that should be flagged it needs to be red flagged because why is an account being disabled or re-enabled it's very suspicious is it not so if someone suddenly goes and re-enables an account and you know this is normally you and it wasn't you that did it this time well that's probably a red flag you should probably go and investigate that why has an old account been re-enabled that's no longer in use or why has another account been disabled I'm not saying there is something wrong, but it might be worth investigating because one day is one day. It might not be a false positive. Also, with regards to resetting passwords. So you can either go do this yourself or you can go and delegate this to junior technicians below you. But I don't think that's what they've got in mind here. So when it comes to resetting passwords, you also want to know about that. You want notifications on that. You want monitoring on that so that if an account's password has been resetted and it was not you, you want to know about that because why was the password to a certain account just changed? It could honestly just be someone really just forgot their password, but one day it might not be. One day it could be that this account has been compromised and just nobody realizes it. Right, moving on. Execution control. Wow, that sounds scary if I just say it off the bat like that. So guys, execution control. What do they mean by that? We're talking about auto run and auto play. There's a bit of a picture for you guys there on the right. So I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but if you go and put something like a USB flash drive or a USB external drive into one of your USB ports, generally what's going to happen on the average machine, a window will pop up on the desktop or on your computer. And for the most part, it's going to go and suggest to you a couple of programs you can go and use to open the files that it found on that device. So if this device has a lot of music files on it, it's going to maybe suggest to you a couple of your media players which you can go and use to open these music files. If there is video files, it might also suggest a couple of media players to you. If there's pictures, it might suggest programs to you that can open pictures. I think you guys get the idea. It's going to go and check what is on that device and give you suggestions on programs on your specific machine that might be able to open those specific files. So what is the big deal about this topic? Well, guys, you need to be careful about that default action that takes place. We do not want the average machine having this pop-up pop up on the desktop giving you suggestions because what it does is it, it technically speaking in the background opens the flash drive or the external drive to a certain extent. Now what is the problem with that? Guys, that executes malware. So one of the biggest ways for malware to spread between machines is in fact your flash drives and external drives. It's not the only way, but it's a very popular way and a very effective way. Because as soon as you stick that into the USB port, even though you personally have not actually opened this device yet, 
It's actually, in fact, already open because your computer has got autoplay and auto run turned on by default. This is actually turned on by default on on machines. And it, to a certain extent, has already actually opened this device. Thus, triggering the malware. That usually triggers the malware. Not always, but usually. It is very, very effective at executing malware. So what you want to go and do here, effectively, I know it's a bit of an annoyance, is to go and turn off autoplay. Now, unfortunately, the result to that would be the next time you go and plug something into the USB port, it's not going to give you that nice list of suggestions, all that, which is a bit unfortunate. But at the very least here, you will not be executing or triggering some sort of malware. This does not completely block malware on a PC. Some malwares do still execute or get still get triggered as soon as you plug it in. But at least it'll be a heck of a lot less, guys. All right, moving on to Windows Defender Antivirus. So folks, Windows Defender itself is not something new. If you go check, you'll find that this has actually been around for a very long time. Now what is new is on Windows 10 going forward, Windows Defender is actually a full-fledged antivirus. A lot of people don't actually realize that, but it actually is. So before Windows 10 was released, we did have Defender, but it wasn't an antivirus. But now from Windows 10 going forward, so that includes obviously Windows 11, it is a full antivirus. So I'm curious to see how this is actually going to play out. I mean, I think as soon as the general public realizes that, hey, hang on a moment, I actually have an antivirus. A lot of people will stop buying an antivirus, at least the ones that just don't care what they use. As long as you use an antivirus, it doesn't really matter what it is, which one it is, whether it's free or not. As long as you use an antivirus, that is still better than having nothing. Um, but I'm sure there are probably also going to be people out there that might know it's an actual antivirus, but they might still prefer to go and buy themselves one from a store, a physical store that they walk into, or buying one online. And that is because of something called preference. Some of you guys might prefer to drive a BMW. The next guy prefers to drive a Mercedes-Benz. But at the end of the day, they do the same thing. They get you from point A to point B. And for someone like me, it doesn't matter what car I drive, as long as it's roadworthy, as long as it's safe, as long as it's light on fuel, I couldn't care less what car I drive. Now, that's the same thing with antiviruses. Some people don't care what they have, as long as they've got something, and then you get some people that, well, have preference, I suppose. So yeah, that's a little bit about the Windows Defender, something you might not have known. Now, speaking of Windows Defender, you also get Windows Defender Firewall. So if you were to have gone and checked the control panel up until Windows 8.1, you'd find the firewall was just called the Windows Firewall. And if you go check this on Windows 10, or at least the very, very old builds of Windows 10, you'd find there in control panel, it's also called the Windows Firewall. And then at some point in time, Microsoft released what we call a feature update. It's those huge fat ones that comes through like once every six months. When I change so much and add so much and remove so much, it's basically a whole flip of new operating system. One of those updates came through. And if you go check control panel now on the newer builds, the name has actually been changed. Where it used to be called Windows Firewall, it's now called Windows Defender Firewall. You still find it in the exact same place. The icon looks exactly the same. Should you go and open it, that'll be exactly the same. So absolutely nothing has changed about it besides the fact that it's name has changed. If you go check on Windows 11 though, there the icon got a bit of a makeover, but other than that, still same can of worms, guys. So there is a bit of a picture on the right, obviously, of what this might look like. So what do we use the Windows Firewall for? Well, to block things, to allow things, to block ports, allow ports, block IPs, allow IPs, same with programs and all that kinds of things. So it's to allow or block ports, allow or block programs, and so on and so forth. There's a bit of a picture for you guys there on the right, obviously, of what this might look like. So that's more the advanced firewall side of things. So just to give you guys a little bit of an overview, I think, let me show you guys practically what this looks like. So I've got a virtual machine idling in the background like usual. And I'm going to swap over to that so I can show you guys what this actually looks like. So let's switch over to that machine. A few moments later. All right, folks, here we are on a Windows 10 machine. Not that it matters. This can be Windows 11 or 10. It's the same can of worms. And on this Windows 10 machine, I'm already in control panel. When you're in control panel, you're going to go to system and security because the Windows firewall is security after all. 
You're gonna click on that bad boy, and here you can see the name is called Windows Defender Firewall. Icon is still the same. Should I go and click on it? That is gonna be the same. But other than that, nothing has changed. It's just the name that has changed. If I click on this bad boy, here we go. That is what we want to see. We want to see green marks. The only time you wanna see red is if you've got some other firewall installed, which is better, because as soon as you install a better one, they normally turn off the Windows firewall automatically. And when you go and uninstall the other firewall, it'll turn the Windows firewall back on automatically, of course. So green is what we want to see. You should not turn off the Windows firewall unless you know what you're doing and it's a very good reason. So generally, just don't do that. If you need to turn it on and off, guys, on the left, there is the button. You turn it on and off. Top left here, it says allow an app or a feature for the Windows firewall. So if you go click on that, here you'll get a list of more or less what you can call allow or block. You'll find sometimes you might just see two rows here. Sometimes you'll see three rows here. It depends on whether you are on a domain or not and all that kinds of jazz. So if you cannot see the options here, if you are not able to click on them, you might have to go here to the top right where it says change settings. You might have to go click on that. Once you click on that, you'll find all these buttons become enabled. And you can, of course, go block or allow something in the firewall. Now going back to the previous page, you can alternatively also go here to where it says advanced settings at the bottom left. Should you go click on that, this is more or less what it's going to look like. It might look like you need like a rocket science degree to be able to configure this, guys, but it's actually very, very straightforward. So inbound and outbound are the rules you get to specify. You can do this on your local machine. You can do this from a server's perspective. Inbound are things coming into your environment, which you might not know about. Outbound are things leaving your computer environment, which you may actually possibly know about. And when it comes to creating rules, if you click on these, you'll find it looks for the most part the same. I did not make these rules, in case you guys are wondering. That actually is what it looks like by default. You'll notice it's all of them going to be green ticks. There's a lot of green ticks here. That means whatever that is, it is allowed. Pretty much everything on your machine or your server is actually allowed by default. So if you're going to come in here, it's more than likely going to be to block something, not to allow something. Now, when it comes to creating rules for blocking or allowing, for outbound and for inbound, it's exactly the same. You go to the top right here. You go click on new rule at the top right. You go there. You've got four choices here. You can go block or allow a program if you know where it's installed. You just browse to where this program or game is installed. You select it, and there you go. You'll be able to go and block or allow it. You can alternatively go choose option two, which is to go and block or allow something on its port number, even though the port number. You can actually go and block or allow more than one port at the same time using the same rule if need be. You can go and choose the third option here, which is to go and choose from a list of predefined templates, if you want to call it something. I am not a fan of this, and I don't recommend you guys use this, because what I've noticed is it only shows you stuff built into Windows. Nothing you've installed afterwards will be shown in this list. And even though it shows you only stuff built into Windows, it doesn't show you everything, and it's quite frankly unuser friendly. So you can go and use it at your discretion if you want to, but I don't recommend it. And then lastly, you can of course go and create a custom rule. So guys, my personal favorite is port, and the second one I use the most is program. So I'm just gonna go and choose port just to give you guys an idea. Click on port. Next, here you can go and choose to block or allow a port. You can go and choose whether it's a TCP or UDP port. If you don't know the difference, TCP is for the most part two-way traffic. UDP is one-way traffic. If you don't know if it's TCP or UDP, pretty much everything these days is two-way traffic, guys. So if you have to make a guess, I would say guess TCP, you're more than likely going to be correct. UDP is more for things like VoIP traffic, like a Skype call, a Teams call, a Zoom call. Those are UDP traffics. Now here at the bottom, you get to specify a port number or port numbers. If you've got more than one, you separate it with a comma. Let's take port 80, for instance. I'm going to go type in port 80. That is for HTTP, normal web browsing. So I'm going to go click on next. Do you want to allow or block this port? Now, for the most part, everything is allowed anyway. So it's probably going to be to go and block something. Next, for which networks is this? I'm just going to go up to default, which is all of them. Next. Now you need to go and give this a name and a description. Now I suppose I could go and say that's not really important. You can probably go and call it whatever you want. And technically you can probably. But I'm going to recommend, guys, you give it a proper user-friendly and professional name and description. Because especially if this is not your machine, if this is a server or someone else's machine, 
I would say put yourself in the next technician's shoes. What would you want to see if you stumbled across this rule? So if you just see some stuff is randomly blocked, you're going to probably think it's malware or something fishy is going on. So give it a proper professional name so that the next technician can identify what it is that you're blocking or allowing. And the description will tell them why you're doing it. So here on the name, I might say block web browsing. Okay, cool. Now they know you're blocking web browsing, but why? Here I can go and say block web browsing because people are browsing during working hours. So that's just an idea. So I'm going to click on cancel here, but if I clicked on finish, it would have actually enforced that rule, guys. So let me just click on cancel and go back to our little bit of presentation. All right, guys, here we are back. Next up, we've got encrypting file system. Some folks call this encryption file system, and some people also call this the EFS encryption system. So EFS stands for encrypting file system. It's a form, or at least one form, of encryption. There's many kinds of encryption you get. There's two kinds we talk about in A plus course, and one of them is EFS, the other is BitLocker. Those are the only ones you need to know when it comes to the A plus course. Anything else, you don't really need to worry about at this point in time until you get to something like Network Plus or Security Plus, perhaps. So first things first, encrypting file system is normally called EFS encryption, something I did mention to you guys already. The EFS encryption is a form of or an example of data at rest encryption. If you don't know what data at rest means, guys, data at rest means it's data that's not moving around. It's sitting still in one location. It's on a computer or a server that's not moving around. It's not being sent over a network or anything in that regard. It is fixed. It's stationary on one machine, and that is it. It's not going to be moving around. So EFS is for that kind of data, and it's a fairly good way of encrypting it. I'm saying fairly good, but I'm not a, because I'm not a very big fan of this. But hey, I still need to explain it to you guys. So EFS is something you would go and use to encrypt a specific file or a specific folder on a machine. It's not going to encrypt the whole machine. It's not going to go and encrypt the whole flash drive or the whole hard drive for that matter. No, it's only going to encrypt a file or a folder. You need to go and right click on this file or this folder and you need to actually go and do this thing called EFS encryption. Now, we don't really use this. This is actually something that doesn't really get asked in the exam. I've seen there's hardly any questions about this in the exam. Um, chances are most of you guys will get zero questions about this one in the exam. Maybe one out of 10 of you guys will get like one question in the exam where you basically just expected to know that EFS is encryption. It's a benefit that comes with the NTFS file system and it's something you use on a specific file or folder. That is it. That's all you need to know from an exam perspective. But for those of you that want to know a little bit more about this, this is something you would go and do on a folder or file if you're sharing a computer with someone these days. That's why people don't use it, because nobody shares computers these days. Every willy-nilly has their own machine these days. So if you go back in time, 10 or 20 years, probably 20 years, folks back then used to share a machine in a household or share a machine in the office. So one, one person would log off on their account, the next person would log on of their specific account and that becomes a bit of a problem if you have stuff on that machine which you're sharing which might be private. So this could be your salary or your pay slip, you know, bank statements, anything that's of sensitive nature which is for your eyes and your eyes only or you prefer for only you to be able to see that. So what you can do in those situations is the person that's currently logged on, he or she would right click on their files or folders and they would go and use this EFS system, which I'll show you guys in just a moment. And the person that's logged on is the only person that can open that file or folder. And when they log off and another person logs onto the same machine with a different account, those accounts can see the folder, but they can't open the folder. They can see the files perhaps, but they can't open the files perhaps. You'll find very often these folders and files will actually be highlighted in green instead of the normal colors. And that's the indicator that it has been encrypted with EFS encryption. So with all of this being said, let me switch back over to that virtual machine I had just a moment ago, just to show you guys how this actually all works. So switching over. A few moments later. All right, folks, here I'm back on that virtual machine. For the sake of time, I've already gone into documents here. I've got a folder in my documents, which is called private files and documents. And I suppose the name doesn't matter. It's just to add some extra oomph to this. I gave it a nice cool little name. 
Now let's imagine that in that folder is what is very sensitive in nature. I've got private stuff in there, which is confidential. It's for my eyes and my eyes only. I don't want anyone else on this machine to be able to see that if they log on of their accounts. Now, how do I encrypt it? You right click on a folder in question like so. You go to the bottom where it says properties like so. And here at the bottom, you'll find us an option that says advanced. You can see there it says advanced. I'm gonna click there on advanced. Whole bunch of options. The one we're looking for today is the one here at the bottom. It says encrypt contents to secure data. You're gonna select that one. You're gonna click on okay. Now, at the moment that folder of mine is actually empty, but if it had a bunch of files and folders in it, once you click on okay, it's gonna ask you, do you wanna encrypt all the files and contents in there or just some of it? So I'm just gonna click on okay, apply. Okay, and there we go. Now in some instances, you might find that the name here will actually turn green. So that name, it says private files and documents. It'll actually turn green. Where my text is now black, it'll actually turn green. That's an indication that has been encrypted. Now at the moment, I can double click on this and I can open it because I am the person that encrypted this folder. But if I log off now and I log on of a different account, an account that did not encrypt this file or folder, it will not be able to open that. It's gonna say access denied. And that account that's now logged in can also go and encrypt their own folders and files, of course. Every user can go and encrypt their own files and folders. Now, as I've said earlier, this is something that's not really asked in the exam. At most, you'll get like one question. This is something we don't even use in the work environment anymore, guys, because nobody shares machines. I think the only example I can thumb suck right now where you might be sharing a machine is where people will share a machine because of working in shifts. This might be something like a hospital. Maybe this is the receptionist at the hospital. There's three of them, they work an eight hour shift and every eight hours they change shifts and each and every one of them has their own account. Now that is the only situation I can think of the top of my head where you might wanna go and use something like this. But other than that guys, highly unlikely you're gonna use this in your work environment, highly unlikely you guys are gonna get this one on the exam. So I wouldn't worry about it. All right, so let's go back to our list of topics. Okay, next we've got Windows BitLocker and BitLocker to go. And it only makes sense that this topic would follow the EFS because like I said of EFS, you get two kinds of encryption which is important in A plus course. The first one is EFS and the second one is BitLocker. Now unlike EFS, BitLocker guys is something you're going to get asked about in the exam and it is something you're gonna be using in the work environment. EFS, eh, not so much. I covered it because it's part of the course. Let it not be said I did not cover it. But with BitLocker, this one, guys, you will get asked about in the exam. Not just a question, up to five questions in some cases. There are some people that write A+, and they'll get asked up to five questions about BitLocker. So it's a very, very, very heavy topic for the exam, guys. Make sure you understand this topic before you go and attempt the exam. So when it comes to BitLocker and BitLocker to go, all we know about it at this point in time is its encryption. It encrypts all the data on your drive. So unlike EFS, which only encrypts a specific file or a specific folder, BitLocker, on the other hand, will go and encrypt a whole flash drive, a whole internal hard drive, or a whole external hard drive. Now, why does the title say BitLocker and BitLocker to go? Because the normal BitLocker is what you would go and use for fixed hard drives. This is the one you would normally go and use. It's for an internal hard drive. So if your laptop or your desktop has a hard drive inside of it, that is the BitLocker you would go and use, the normal one. If you have a flash drive, in other words, a memory stick or USB stick, you've just slide it into a USB port or an external hard drive, that classifies as a removable. And that is what you would use BitLocker to go on. Anything that you can take and go is where you would use BitLocker to go. So that's how you can remember it. When you can take something and go from your machine, that's when you use BitLocker to go, guys. So if you have a flash drive or a hard drive, or your company has something like that, which is seen as something with sensitive information on it, you wanna go and use BitLocker. If this laptop or desktop has something very sensitive on it, you wanna go and use BitLocker. That is why we use it. It's more common to see people using BitLocker on a laptop than a desktop. Why? Because laptops are on the go. They're moving around. So not if, but when your laptop gets misplaced, stolen, whatever the case might be, companies are normally not too concerned about the laptop itself because it's normally insured for the most part. It's not the end of the world. It's more the data 
on that laptop, which is of concern. You might have sensitive information on there. You might have trade secrets on there, something that the opposition will be willing to pay big bucks for if they can get their hands on it, which is why companies force some employees to use BitLocker so that if the laptop ran, lands in the wrong hands, the data is encrypted and it's rendered useless. The same goes for anything that's removable, like a flash drive or an external hard drive. If you or your company work with something very sensitive, whatever it might be, BitLocker is the way to go, guys, or at least I should say BitLocker to go. Now, this amazing tool called BitLocker, originally when it came out, which was moons ago, many, many moons ago, it had a couple of requirements. Some people might call these prerequisites. Now, for you or someone, like a company, to be able to use BitLocker, you needed to make sure you met these requirements per PC, per user. The first one, guys, is a TPM. Now, these requirements I'm mentioning to you guys is in the exam. There's a question in the exam. It's not just a normal multiple choice question. Most questions in the exam will be a question where they give you four possible answers. You choose one, you move on of your day. This is not just a normal multiple choice question. They'll give you six to eight possible choices, and they're going to say choose all that apply or choose three or choose four. You need to make sure you understand these requirements. So the first one is a TPM. TPM is short for Trusted Platform Module. It's an actual chip on the motherboard that does the encryption and stores encryption keys and that kinds of nonsense. So back in the day, you needed to go and make sure you buy a motherboard that actually has this magical chip on it. Not all motherboards came out of it. And even till this day, not all motherboards have these TPM chips. Now granted, a lot more motherboards have them these days and the prices really come down. But back then, uh-uh. You had to go and buy a motherboard that had this chip, and I can guarantee you it would have costed you a lot more money compared to a normal motherboard. Now, besides the TPM, you needed to also have a smart card. It's kind of like a normal card, except it's got a little computer in it, basically, for the most part. Now, to use this smart card, you need a special reader, a smart card reader. So every machine for every employee back in the day needed to have a TPM, it needed to have a smart card and it needed to have a smart card reader to read to read said smart card. That was a bit of a problem. Those are the three requirements, guys, or at least should I say the original requirements. Nowadays, no, you don't need that. But the exam is going to want to see if you know and if you understand that these were the original requirements. Now, as for the TPM, good news is most motherboards actually do have them these days. And if you don't have a TPM chip, there's a way around that. So Microsoft, you can basically imagine them sitting around a round table and they basically probably said, okay, boys, a lot of our customers want to use this great benefit called BitLocker, but they can't because they don't have a TPM. What can we do to assist our customers to get them to use this benefit? And some clever bloke in this meeting probably said, hey, how about we use group policies? So yes, guys, you can go and use a group policy. There's a policy called allow additional authentication at startup, which allows you to use BitLocker without a compatible TPM chip. So if you find yourself in a sticky situation where you, your users or your customers don't have a TPM chip on a motherboard for a machine, you can go to group policy. There's a policy you can go and turn on. It says allow additional authentication at startup and it allows you to use BitLocker without a TPM chip. Something I'll show you guys in a couple of moments. Now, as for the smart card and the smart card reader, the idea behind that is to symbolize something that you or the user have physically on their person. So the guys, once again, in this meeting probably said, hey, what can we come up with to try and substitute the smart card with, with something else that the guys have on their person so that they don't have to go and buy this expensive, inconvenient card and card reader? And I'm assuming someone at this meeting probably said, hey, but how about flash drives? Because everybody's got a flash drive these days. So, if need be, guys, you can go and use your flash drive as if it's a smart card. Now, how that's going to work is if you stick that stick, <laughs> stick that stick into the USB port, it has to be in there when you hit the power button on your laptop or desktop. You can think of it as a key to your car. If the key is not in the ignition, that car is not going nowhere. You know, ignoring the fact that it could be hotwired. So, you need to have the car with the key. And the key has to be turned for that card to start. Now, if you press the power button on your laptop or desktop, the stick should already be in the USB port. 
If you don't have the stick, if it's not in, uh-uh, that machine ain't going nowhere. It's not going to start, guys. Now, as for the recovery key, what is that and where does that fit into place, guys? Now, encryption is to render a drive or something useless. If it gets into the wrong hands, it's rendered useless. Now, what if one day you forget the password or you lose that flash drive or that smart card? What then? Well, as long as you are the original owner, there needs to always be a way or a means for you to recover this drive or this device. It's kind of like forgetting the password to your Gmail account or your YouTube or your phone or whatever. As long as you're the original owner to that account or that device, there's always a way for you to recover it. And when it comes to encryption, it's just the same story, guys. So the recovery key is a very long key. It's an inconvenient key. It looks like a product key, except it's about three times longer. It's got no spaces, no dashes, no nothing. So it's very, very unuser friendly. This key is supposed to be saved somewhere safely, you know, stored somewhere safely. And in the event of you, oopsie daisy, forgetting your password or flash drive, you would use this key to recover said drive or whatever this drive might be. Anyway, so I'm going to switch over to a machine in the background, not a virtual machine, an actual machine I'm using today to show you guys what this BitLocker looks like, or just, just a basic idea. I'm not going to go through the whole procedure. So let me quickly switch over. A few moments later. All right, folks, so here we are on the machine that I'm using today. Um, if you would like to use BitLocker on a drive, let's say I wanted to use it on this drive here, it says Windows 7. So it's a secondary drive. There's no Windows 7 installed on it anymore. So if I would like to encrypt this drive, how you would go about doing that is to right click on the drive. You'll see here's an option that says turn BitLocker on. Now you'll notice BitLocker is only there in that list if you've got the right edition of Windows. You need to have enterprise or professional, or at the very least the enterprise for the most part. If you've got a home, basic, whatever edition, you're not going to find BitLocker. It's a benefit that you only get on the company editions of Windows. So you click on that bad boy that says BitLocker. Here we go. Now mine is working. There's a very good chance you might get an error here. It says you do not have a TPM chip because a lot of people don't. And if you do not have a TPM chip, you're going to have to go into your group policies first and turn on that policy that says allow additional authentication at startup. Now that policy I've been mentioning more than once, guys. There's a reason I've been saying it so many times. It's a question in your exam. You might get it, you might not get it, but it is in the pool. Remember, turn on additional authentication at startup. That's what it's called. I'll show you guys in a moment what that policy looks like. You're not going to be expected to browse to the policy in group policy in the exam, but you will be expected to know which one it is. Now here on this list where we are right now, guys, you get to choose whether you want to use just a password, just a smart card or both. Should you use both, that would be an example of multi-factor authentication. Should you choose smart card, it's not necessarily an actual smart card, as we've discussed before. It could actually be a flash drive now. I'm going to use just pause or just to get to the next menu because I want to show you something else on the next menu here. So let me just type in this password. There we go. Clicking on next. All right. So this menu we're looking at right now, guys, is also a question in the exam. Now, many moons ago, it used to be just three options here. Save to USB flash drive, save to a file, and print recovery key. This fourth one got added like a couple of years ago. And when it added it, it did not say save to Microsoft account. It said save to online account. There's a point in time where it said save to a cloud account. And now it says save to a Microsoft account. They keep changing their minds. They can't make up their minds as to what the name should be. The point is you're going to save it online. So what are these options? It is where or how you can store that recovery key we spoke of earlier. So should you find yourself in that unfortunate event where you've got locked out because you forgot the password or you lost the flash drive, this recovery key that we're about to back up here is what you would use to recover that drive. Now, this is a question exam where you're not just going to choose one answer. They're going to say choose all that apply. And from a list of eight or more choices, randomly, this is going to be randomized, you will need to choose the options I show in front of you. You're going to have to choose all four of these. Failing to do so, you'll get the question wrong. So that is the answer in the exam, guys. There are the four choices. Now you know. Now, when it comes to that other thing I spoke about where I said, if you do not have a TPM chip, you might have an error that displays on your machine. 
I'm going to switch over to that other virtual machine I had earlier, which has got Windows 10 on it, just to show you guys what it actually looks like when you get that error. Just for interest sake. So let's just quickly switch over. And three weeks later. All right, so here we are on the Windows 10 virtual machine. I'm already here in the place called this PC. You can see it's just one hard drive. Once again, I'm going to right click on a hard drive. Once again, you'll see it says turn on BitLocker, except this time I'm probably going to get an error. I happen to know that this virtual machine does not have a TPM chip, so it's probably going to give me an error. So let me click on that, and there we go. This device can't use a trusted platform module because it doesn't have one. It's a virtual machine. So I will have to go and use a group policy, guys. Let me see if I can find on this virtual machine. I actually haven't browsed for it yet on this virtual machine. You can go to the bottom left here. I'm going to type in gpedit.msc to get to my group policies. There we go. Once again, you do not need to know how to get to this policy, guys. There's over 3,000 group policies you can go and configure on a laptop, desktop, or server. You don't need to know how to get to it. You just need to know what the policy is. I'm going to make this nice and big for you guys. Let me just make some room so you guys can see it nice and clearly. All right, so I'm going to browse to it. You don't need to know how to do that. So let me just browse to it. Windows Components. BitLocker Drive Encryption. You can see there it is. The only reason why I know where it is is because this is a topic in many courses and it's something that's very common that we use in our everyday to day lives. So unless something is something you use every day, you're probably not going to remember where it is. Even I don't know where most group policies are. Half the time, if not more than half the time, I find myself going to a search engine like Google and just searching where this policy is that I'm looking for. Let me just see where, which one it is. Yup, it's this one. All right, so in the exam, this is an exhibit. It's an interactive exhibit which means you're gonna see a screenshot. You're gonna see what I see in front of me. It's not gonna list all of these answers. Well, it is, but it's not. Instead of listing them like the usual answers, which is gonna take, it's gonna be crazy because it's just way too many of them. They give you a screenshot, only this section. So where I'm circling my mouse cursor, that is what will be in the screenshot. And they're gonna ask you, which group policy should you configure to allow the person to use BitLocker without a TPM? You'll see it here, it says configure or require additional authentication because it's going to ask you for an extra password or a flash drive now, guys. So your normal Windows password, that is a form of authentication. But before you even get to that password screen, you're going to see a black screen. It's going to have a cursor flashing and that's where you provide your BitLocker password to unencrypt the hard drive. Hence the name requiring additional authentication at startup. So in the exam, you're actually going to click on the answer in the exhibit it's going to highlight it in green. If I click on mine, it highlights it in blue. In the exam, it highlights it in green. Now, this stuff that just popped up on the left, you're not going to see that popping up in the exam. It'll just highlight it in green. That is it. You click next, you go to the next question, guys. Now, in real life, you're going to have to actually go a bit further than that. You can have to actually go and right-click on this in real life. Edit. And you'll see here, it actually says, allow BitLocker without a compatible TPM. So, yes. And you're going to have to go and enable that sucker. But I'm not going to do that because, well, I don't have to. All right. So let's go back to our list of topics. All right, folks. So I think we pretty much covered BitLocker. I might have gone too far with BitLocker. But as I've said, it's very important for the exam. So I needed to make sure you understand what BitLocker is and everything you could possibly be asked about in the exam. I needed to make sure I covered that so that you guys don't get caught off guard. So let it not be said I did not cover it properly. Guys, this was actually the last topic for the first section in this module. Finally, we're moving on to the second and the last section of this module, which is troubleshoot workstation security issues. All right, folks, the first topic in this section we're going to be talking about is malware vectors. So before I start listing anything here, guys, if you are still watching the video at this point in time, just a little bit of fun. Um, if you're still watching the video, I would say, quote some random phrase from one of the Harry Potter movies, just for fun. So if you've ever watched one of the Harry Potter videos, you can quote any random phrase from the Harry Potter movies. This is just for fun. Um, anyone that hasn't actually watched the full video would obviously get confused as to what the heck is going on in the comment section now. So some random phrase, any phrase from any Harry Potter movie, you can quote it in the comment section down below. Sometimes I just give a secret, secret word or a secret sentence. If you would like to, you know, maybe make a suggestion as to what should be in the next video, some secret phrase or something like that, you're more than welcome to suggest that in the Discord server. So if you're not aware, 
in the video's description down below, like way at the bottom of the video description, there's a Discord server of mine. It's called Free IT Training. It's completely free for those of you that know what Discord is. It's a community of IT people, which includes myself. A lot of the people, if not most of the people on that server are studying something like A+. But there's also a lot of people on there that has, has already done A+. It's got lots of knowledge and experience. And if you've got any questions, if you're struggling with something, you can go there, you can post your question, and someone like myself, it might even be myself, will answer your question. And if you see someone else struggling, and it happens to be something you know or understand, well, you can obviously help that person as well. So if you'd like to go and post a phrase, a sentence, or a suggestion as to what could be possibly be in the next video, well, that's the place where you can go and do it. You can chat with me there on that server. So getting back to malware vectors, guys. Malware, for those of you who don't know, is not actually something specific. Some folks are under the impression that malware is a virus, or malware is ransomware. Now, it's not wrong, but it's not right. Malware is a category, which includes a lot of harmful things. Um, it, for example, includes worms. One of many things. What is a worm? It's not the kind your animals has, like your dog, your cat. A worm is something that's nearly extinct. I actually thought it was extinct there for a couple of years. And then about two, three years ago, I randomly saw one. So how does a worm spread? Let's start of that. It spreads pretty much the same way you would expect a virus or ransomware to spread. The most common way back in the day for someone to get this was via an email. So you or the user got an email, you opened the wrong email, or you opened the attachment or something in the email, boom, you've got a worm. Now, the first thing it does normally is it would send itself out to everybody that you've received an email from recently or that you've sent an email to recently. So it's going to send itself out to all of those people. And because they see this mail is coming from you, they're going to trust it and they're going to open it and boom, they've got the worm as well. So that's how it spreads. Now, where it gets even worse now is you're going to see a lot of ads on your machine. At least that's what happened most of the time. It's like a lot. In a matter of one second, you'll have like five or 10 ads popping up on your screen, rendering your computer useless. So that's problem number two. Problem number three, these ads, never mind them rendering the computer useless, are inappropriate ads. It's very embarrassing ads. Horse tranquilizers, enhancements, this or that. It is very awkward, embarrassing ads. Now, even though you're innocent here, these people probably might even know it deep down in their hearts that you're innocent. Every time they see you now, or when they get an email from you now in the future, they're going to remember that time that they got this weird, yeah, not so inappropriate, it's not appropriate stuff. So it's it's just one giant awkward situation. So that's a worm. Now the next one up that falls into the category of malware is viruses. Viruses is normally a piece of code with malicious intent. It's actually out to do harm to you, your machine, or someone else's machine, or someone else in general. It's malicious code with malicious intent. And then we get someone something called a Trojan or Trojan horse. Now, a lot of folks are in the impression that a Trojan, or should I say Trojan horse, is the same as a virus. I think where the misconception here comes in is probably the antiviruses. They're probably to blame here because when you go and do a scan or when these scans happen automatically, you'll find very often they detect viruses and Trojans. If you go look at the list of stuff that has now been detected and blocked and quarantined, You'll find very often it's going to list a couple of viruses, it's going to list a couple of trojans, and because these things get thrown into the same list in your antivirus, people kind of get this impression that it's a form of virus. It's not. A trojan horse and a virus, guys, is not the same thing. A trojan or a trojan horse is something pretending to be one thing, something useful in most cases, while in fact it is something else. It's in fact something harmful, damaging your computer silently in the background. Hence the name Trojan Horse. It's based on that old Greek mythology story, and there's even a movie based on it. I think the movie's called Troy. It's like 20 years or 30 years old, this movie. It's called Troy. So there was a Trojan army back in the day. That's how the story goes. And like all armies and stuff back in the day, they were trying to conquer territory. Towns and cities and countries and whatever. They were trying to conquer territory. So this Trojan army went from town to town, fought them, conquered them, and there you go. They conquered territory. And then eventually they got to this one town, you can go watch the movie called Troy, which had these huge impenetrable walls and gates. The army was very small, so they could actually have conquered them very easily. 
But why they could not conquer them was because of these giant walls and these giant gates. So the Trojan Horse army came up with something quite clever. They made this giant sculpture of a wooden horse and left it at the town gates as a peace offering, so to speak. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And in the middle or in the belly of this wooden horse, they left a bunch of soldiers. I don't know how many, let's just say 10 for argument's sake. So there's a bunch of soldiers hidden in the belly of this supposed peace offering, if you want to call it that. And they skedaddled out of there. Eventually, they opened the town gates. They brought in the sculpture of the wooden horse, thinking to themselves, Yay, we won this war. They gave up. And obviously, they started celebrating, drinking wine, and did whatever they did in those times to celebrate. And then during the course of the night, when they, well, fell asleep, asleep and they passed out from being drunk and all that stuff, the soldiers in the belly of this horse got out and killed them all in their sleep. So they were pretending to be a peace offering when in fact they were killing them in their sleep. Trojan horse, guys, in IT terms means the same thing, which is why it's called a Trojan horse. It's going to pretend to be some useful toolbar, some useful game, some useful program. Whatever it's pretending to be, you'll notice most of the time actually does work. If it's pretending to be a game, the game will most of the time actually work because if it does not, you're probably going to go and uninstall it. And if you're going to uninstall it, well, then the Trojan horse is not going to do what it's supposed to do. So the whole idea is to try and get you to leave this on your machine. And to do that, I need to get this program that it's pretending to be to actually work. And while you're playing this game or using this program or this toolbar or whatever it is, it's going to kill your machine selling in the background or doing something very, very bad. So there we go, three things in malware. A fourth one I'm gonna add here for you guys is spyware. Like the name suggests, it's used to spy on you or someone. Now, I don't know if you guys would believe me if I said this, but in spyware, you get subcategories. Now, would you believe me if I said in those subcategories, you get sub-subcategories? You sometimes even get sub-sub-subcategories. Yeah, <laughs> it gets crazy, really, it's trippy. So in spyware, just to give you guys a ballpark idea here, you get something called keyloggers. I suppose that's a category. So you get the category called keyloggers. It's used to record the keystrokes that you go and type on a keyboard or that the user goes and types on the keyboard. Now in the category of keyloggers, you get the kind of keylogger that records every keystroke you make. And then you get the kind of keylogger that records only when you're about to go and type in something sensitive. So when you open a browser and you're about to log into something somewhere and you're about to type on using them password, it only records that and it only sends that to the perpetrator. And then of course you get the other one I mentioned earlier which just records everything. Now at first glance, if you had to make a guess which one is more dangerous, some folks might think it's the one that records everything because it's everything for crying out loud. I suppose, but no, it's not. I used to use both of these because I used to do penetration testing for companies, guys. The one that records everything is a nightmare. We don't realize how much the average person types. It's just like speaking words. We type an insane amount of stuff every day, even if your person doesn't type a lot. And for me, as the perpetrator, to go through everything you've typed with a digital comb in the hopes of maybe getting something of value, maybe getting something sensitive, it's gonna take me forever. It's gonna take me two, three days to go through everything you've typed today and this is now to hopefully get something of value and I might actually come out empty handed. You know how frustrating that is. So the one that actually records only the sensitive stuff, that is the dangerous one. Now in spyware in general, you also get the kind of spyware that can record real time what you're doing or show real time what you're doing. Um, those are very dangerous. So it actually shows like a video feed to someone else somewhere else exactly what you're doing. They can see your mouse cursor moving around. It's kind of like a video stream. They can see exactly what you're doing. Now, when are we talking about this real-time one or the other one? In most cases, when someone's got spyware, it's because someone had direct access to that machine. It's not set in stone. It's just generally this is required. So I would say 9 out of 10 times to get spyware onto a machine, someone had to have direct access to that machine. So if you look at the spyware that streams real-time what you're doing, the reason that's on your machine is probably because your employer has put it there. They want to see real time whether you're doing your work or not. And your employer, at some point in time, had direct access to that machine. Now, what you might also find this kind of spyware is actually, believe it or not, sometimes between spouses. The one thinks the other one is cheating on them. 
And they'll go and install it on a machine in the household that they share. And when the one is at work, he or she will spy on the other one at home. Yeah, believe it or not. Now, the last form of malware I'm going to give you guys here for today is ransomware. Ransomware, like the name suggests, is when something is being held ransom. Instead of it being an actual person that's being host held hostage, it's going to be your data. So your machine or your whole company's machines, possibly the service, have now been encrypted. As soon as you get this ransomware, you normally get this via flash drive or email in most cases, but it can also spread via other ways. As soon as you get malware, like ransomware, it encrypts everything. And if you got it only on your machine and you were connected to the network, chances are everybody else is now also encrypted. You cannot browse the machine in most cases. Sometimes you can browse the machine, but all your icons for all your files and everything is turned blank. And you'll find that in most cases, even the names for all these files have been changed. What is the name? It's normally the Bitcoin account or the cryptocurrency account that you have to go and make payment to with the ransom. If they normally want a ransom, it's normally in cryptocurrency. It used to only be Bitcoin in the day, back in the day, up until about 2015, 2016. But nowadays I see they actually give you payment options, which is hilarious. They give you different ways to go and pay. You can use Bitcoin. You can use one of the other forms of cryptocurrency. They normally give you a time frame as well. So they'll tell you, hey, you've got 24 hours. You've got 48 hours. You've got 72 hours to pay this ransom. Failing to do so, they will delete your data permanently, which is also kind of hilarious because... Technically, you've really lost access to it, and now they're threatening to delete it. Ooh, scary. Now, just like a real hostage situation, you could go and pay the ransom if you really want to. We don't recommend you do that. And just like a real hostage situation, if you pay the ransom, there's no guarantee they will release the hostage. In this case, your data. They might release your data. They might not release your data. Now, let's say they do release your data. Just because they've released your data does not mean they will not go and re-encrypt your data at a later point in time. Same with a hostage. So maybe it's some rich individual, they kidnapped this person's kid from school, you're a multi-millionaire, you pay the ransom, you've now set the norm. You've set the bar that you're willing to pay and that you can pay. Maybe six months later, they go and re-kidnap the kid and they start the whole cycle all over again because they know you've got the moolah. So yeah up to you whether you want to pay this or not we recommend you don't do that guys all right moving on troubleshoot desktop symptoms so they say desktop here but it actually applies to laptops as well so let's look at performance symptoms so should you or one of your users uh, notice that this laptop or desktop is getting for example faulty slow it's sluggish it's laggy you know the machine just gets slow you'll find that when you buy a new laptop or desktop even if it's a cheap laptop or desktop they're all relatively fast in the beginning as time goes by they get slower and slower and slower now, this can be a result of multiple things it could be that there's a lot of stuff starting up with the machine in the background so you might need to go and turn some of the stuff off you could do that in your task manager there's a tab that says start up it could be that your main hard drive being drive C is too full. You should never fill up your main hard drive completely because a portion of it gets used as virtual memory. In other words, as if it is RAM. And if your main hard drive is too full, you can also notice that your performance is going to go down and down and down. It could be that maybe you just don't have enough RAM. It could be that maybe this machine is overheating. If a machine overheats, you're going to find that the performance is going to go lower and lower and lower. It can also be that the machine has got malware on the machine. All of these are some of the most common things that could cause you to have some performance loss. Now, what if someone is, for example, unable to access the network? A list of things that can cause this, guys, is also very, very, very long. Some of the most common causes for this would be if it's a network cable, it might be unplugged, it might be damaged. If this person is connecting via wireless, maybe they have disconnected, maybe they're too far away from the signal, Maybe the password has changed. These could be possible reasons for someone being unable to connect. Maybe there's just not any IP addresses left. You normally need to get an IP address. And if you're unable to get one for whatever reason, that could also result into you not having network access. Maybe the IP address is on the machine. You configure it manually, but you have not configured it correctly manually. That could also be a reason. And the list of things, of course, goes on and on and on. If you'd like to know more about that, you know, maybe because you're trying to troubleshoot something in the office, you can go and contact me on my Discord server. You can have a chat with me there. 
But what I've mentioned to you here right now is more than enough to be able to pass the exam. Now, also as for troubleshooting desktop symptoms, what about file system errors and anomalies? So when you start experiencing errors, that can be for any amount of reason. It could be that you've got malware, but most often it's not malware. It could really just be a matter that maybe something just got corrupt on a hard drive. It happens, guys. It's got nothing to do with the size of the hard drive, with the type of hard drive, with the age of the hard drive. It's completely random. I used to work in the industry. I used to sell any kind of hard drive, any size hard drive. And I can always, I can honestly tell you guys, they are all equally good. Now, with some types of hardware, yes, some brands really are better than other brands. I'm not going to say what I'm talking about because that would be promoting and demoting certain brands. But when it comes to hard drives, they are the same, guys. The only difference really at the end of the day is the size and the type of hard drive. Like, are you using a magnetic one? In other words, mechanical. Are you using a hybrid hard drive or a solid hard drive? Those are the main differences here. But maybe you bought a hard drive and it only lasted you a month and then it crashed and now you had a bad experience and now you think that's a bad brand. It could just be a dud. There's been times I would sell brand X, let's call it brand one, and I would never have issues and then suddenly in one week, all of those would come back. That was normally a factory fault. All of that is a bad batch. And then a week after that, I never have any comebacks again. This has happened with all the brands I've sold where randomly... It would be a certain period for like a day or two or a week or so where all of them would come back or nearly all of them would come back. And that's normally a bad batch. Now, if you just get a normal error and the hard drive itself has not crashed, you can go and use something like check disk. There's a command you can go and use. You can do this in command prompt or you can just go and right click on a hard drive, go to the tools tab and click on the, you know, the, the check disk tool and you can go run it from there. So all of these things I've just mentioned are things that's completely random. All right, let's take a look at best practices for malware. So should you suspect or should you know a machine has got malware on it, here's a couple of steps given to us by Comtia as to what we should go and do. Now, for the most part, I actually do agree with Comtia, which is actually surprising because sometimes I like to argue with them. You know, don't believe everything you guys see in the manuals or the slideshows and stuff, guys. There's a lot of information which is outdated. It's sometimes just theory information, but in reality, it's actually different. Anyway, so the first thing CompTIA says we should go and do is investigate and verify the malware symptoms. So first of all, make sure this machine is actually infected with malware. Check the symptoms. What is it actually doing? Now, once you've confirmed it, okay, you know what? This machine does in fact have some sort of malware. Your next course of action, which is very important, is to quarantine that infected system or infected systems. Anything you suspect has been infected, quarantine it. So if it's a desktop PC, plug out the network cable, plug out all the cables. If it's a laptop, disconnect from the Wi-Fi. Now, with a laptop, I would say don't just disconnect from the Wi-Fi. You'll find very often laptops will often go and reconnect automatically because they remember the password. Tell the laptop to forget that network. When you tell the laptop to forget that network, it's going to forget the password and will not be able to go and auto reconnect again. Now, I also want you guys to completely remove the laptop or the desktop from that environment. So if this desktop PC is in an office, do not leave it unplugged in that office. Take it away. Take it to your office. Lock it up somewhere. Because what I've seen happen in some companies here, guys, is some people will come back into that office. They'll say, oh, why is this PC unplugged? Let me go plug it back in. And then boom, there you go. The virus is spreading now on the system and on the network because someone was wondering why it was unplugged. They didn't know what was going on and they went and plugged it back in. So to avoid someone from accidentally plugging it back in, do not leave it there. Once you've quarantined the systems, guys, and once you've taken it away from that environment, you need to go and disable system restore and quite frankly, disable any other form of backups on these machines. That is to prevent that system from automatically, accidentally backing up the virus and preserving the virus. So you should always have system restore on and your backups on, but immediately, as soon as you notice there's a malware on that, malware of some kind on that system, you disable all of these to prevent your backups from being compromised and to prevent this malware from getting preserved. Once you've done that, you remediate the infected systems, in other words, fix them, 
Once you fix them, you schedule a couple of antivirus scans and you make sure the updates are taking place. Once you've get and gotten all of that done, then you go and re-enable System Restore and turn on all your backups and you go and make sure the backups have taken place and you make sure a, re a new restore point is done. Now, once you're done with everything, you educate the user, which might be the most important thing here. It sounds stupid, but the user is always the weakest link. You tell them, sir, ma'am, do not do this, do not do that. You educate that user. All right, guys, the last topic for this module and for this section, infected systems quarantine. So we spoke about quarantining a system once it's been infected. This is, well, to prevent the thing from obviously spreading. I think it speaks for itself. So when it comes to quarantining infected systems, prevent the use of privileged accounts. So would it be you, would it be someone else, do not use a high-ranking account that's got a lot of permissions. Use as low ranking accounts, as low privileged accounts as possible to remedy the situation. Otherwise, it could be the matter of those accounts, their information is going to be sent somewhere else. Isolate this machine or this device from the production network. Do not plug it in unless you absolutely need to. I would say just don't. Isolate and scan any removable media. So when you detected that this machine has been infected, did it have anything else plugged into it? A flash drive? a hard drive, anything like that was plugged in, there's a very good chance that these things could have been compromised. You want to go and scan those as well. And what they mentioned here, which we did mention before, disable system restore, and this is to prevent, you know, obviously the malware from being preserved. So turn off backup services like system restore that might preserve the malware. Otherwise, as soon as you go and fix the PC, the virus is going to just find its way back on there again. Right, folks, if you've learned something in this module, which I hope, and I believe you guys probably did, please give the video a like. I really appreciate it when you guys do that. Maybe consider subscribing. Guys, don't disappear on me just yet. Thank you to all of you guys that's been sponsoring this video and this channel. Thank you to the Patreon guys. Thank you to the PayPal guys. There's a list of some of the Patreon sponsors. Guys, thank you very much. You're really helping me a lot. There's a list of some of the PayPal sponsors. Thank you very much. And then also for those of you that's been sponsoring by clicking on the thanks button below the video or just buying me a coffee or a milkshake. If you would like to sponsor the channel, if you're not doing so already, you can find that information in the video description down below, guys. It would be appreciated. And then lastly, I'm just going to mention again, there is a Discord server. I did say it before and I'm saying it again. You can find that in the video description down below as well. It's probably going to be literally at the bottom, bottom of the video description. There is the Discord server link. Click on that. Join it. Join our community. Come have some fun of us. All right, folks, I will speak to you again in module 18 of the CompTIA A-plus course.